Hello, I'm Vasilis Mon for this PhD student, University College London. I'm going to talk about optimization for attack surface exploration, and in particular focus on the case of TLS. This joint work with Jamie Hayes from University College London. To begin with, attack surface exploration is a process that, uh, given a system or protocol, will first add its operation, uh, its security properties, and the trust assumptions it operates on, then define the adversaries and their goals. And then given those adversaries, we design and realize attacks that we can later uh, further optimize. Uh, the goal of actually coming up with attacks that we will later optimize uh, has to do with us advancing the state of the art so as to better evaluate the security of the given system or protocol, uh, as well as uh, further improving our defenses uh, once we have a good understanding of uh, what they are doing well and where we are actually failing. This process is iterative, meaning that um, given an attack, we always go back to the beginning, uh, verify how efficient it is, check its false positives, uh, false negatives, uh, and then uh, perhaps revisit the assumptions with regards to our adversaries, um, check if we can relax any, see if we can do anything better. Um, this process is a best effort process and usually requires human involvement. Uh, modern machine learning can actually help us advance further the state of the art um, uh, if we incorporate it into this optimization process. And here's the added benefit that it can minimize human involvement. However, for that to be possible, there are a couple of requirements that need to be met. The first one is that it should be easier to collect data and train a model than to optimize the attack manually. And the second is that well, uh, given an adversary, the goal of that adversary needs to be expressed uh, in some form that um, makes sense for the machine learning model. In that case, it's a, a differentiable loss function. Uh, our use case, as I said earlier, is traffic fingerprinting. Um, there are two types that we're going to consider. One is web page uh, fingerprinting, in particular TLS. In that case, the adversary is intercepting traffic between the client's browser and the website that the client is visiting. As you may know, TLS does not protect the IP of the server visited, so we're going to assume that the uh, adversary knows which website the victim is visiting. However, what the adversary doesn't know is the exact web page that is uh, visited by the victim. Uh, so that's the one, use, the one use of web page fingerprinting. There is another use that does not have to do with surveillance. It's um, a benign use case where network administrators are actually monitoring their network for malware. And to do that, they are intercepting TLS traffic through their network and try to uh, match that traffic to command and control servers or unique patterns that uh, malware um, traffic exhibits. The second and most popular type of uh, traffic fingerprinting is uh, website fingerprinting. We often uh, see it in papers with regards to Tor. Uh, in that case, the adversary doesn't know which website the victim is uh, visiting. The adversary is standing in between any intercepting traffic in between uh, the client and the entry node of the Tor network. And this, the, as an adversary is trying to infer which website this time uh, the victim is visiting. The fingerprinting task is very simple. The adversary captures the traffic uh, between the victim and the server visited or the Tor entry node and then converts it into a sequence of bytes that denote the length of the packets sent or received by the adversary. So that sequence of bytes uh, contains only the length and the direction of the packet sent. Um, the process for the fingerprinting from the adversary's perspective is, as a first step, the adversary compiles usually a data set of labeled sequences from web pages or websites that they want to fingerprint. And then uh, this is actually fairly easy to, sim to automate and then um, prepares a classification system. That classification system can be anything. It can be a very advanced machine learning system but based on machine learning, or it can be um, uh, just a manual annotation system. So any anything really. Uh, and then the third step is uh, once the adversary captures some traffic that they wish to fingerprint, they push it through the system uh, to have it classified. Since uh, the first step is fairly easy to automate, uh, machine learning can actually help with steps two and three. So now we're going to go through a non-exhaustive review of the literature. We'll see how machine learning uh, 
helped advance that field further in the last few years. So up until 2016, uh, most of the literature was working with incremental steps uh, with regards to the performance of uh, fingerprinting adversaries. And in most papers, there was some um, element of feature engineering, as well as uh, some small advancements with regards to the fingerprinting uh, technique by itself. However, since 2017, uh, deep learning models became uh, more common in that community. Uh, and in particular, the advantage that those uh, models brought is that now uh, you don't have to um, do feature engineering manually, but instead you can use a deep learning model that's going to do it auto in, a, in an automated manner uh, without you having to uh, manually craft the features that make most, most of the sense. Because of the success and very good performance of deep learning models, in the same period, um, the, the idea of vulnerability approximators was proposed. Uh, given a website fingerprinting defense, we can actually um, estimate the security bounds of an adversary given a chosen feature set. Uh, this is great because now we have a lower bound of security, which is uh, something we didn't have before. However, the downside of that is that um, uh, the estimation can be done only based on a chosen feature set. Uh, this gap was actually covered by a paper published later on on a slightly different sub area though of fingerprinting. So it didn't cover all the features um, that the original paper uh, was looking into. Uh, but that second paper was actually focusing on the learnability and vulnerability of the protocol based uh, on an exhaustive search of the uh, features. That Moving on to 2019, even though we have very good deep learning models that can extract the features automatically for us, there is still research on features going on for a very good reason. So while for the attacker, the exact features don't necessarily need to be need to make sense, for um, designing efficient defenses, the interpretability of features and the intuition we build around those is still uh, important. So that specific paper was focusing on uh, the timing element of features. So it's bringing in another dimension that has been somewhat overlooked earlier and is, is driving this, uh, this direction forward. Now, because of the uh, very good performance we had with existing adversaries, we also started uh, to explore uh, more realistic ones, uh, meaning that um, other dimensions of uh, the attackers can now be further relaxed. Um, but one of the problems that had been expressed actually in 2014, so several years ago, but had, hadn't been explored adequately, is data stainless. Uh, given a fingerprinting system is trained on a set of data, um, one of, of the problems that an adversary may have is that those data become stale fairly quickly as the content of the websites is changing. So uh, one of the papers that first brought this problem up is the Triple F fingerprinting published last year, and they are looking into exactly that uh, element, um, aiming to make adversaries and attacks more realistic in the real world in a real world environment. Uh, so that's a generalizability property that they that they mention and they uh, want to address staleness uh, of the tra training data. Uh, there is also a bootstrap time, which is another dimension they are considering with regards to how quickly can a, a, an adversary train a classifier and have it ready to be used. And then finally, they are also focusing on uh, flexibility and transferability, because as an adversary, you may want to add a new uh, site or web page to be monitored. So it's also important to have this kind of flexibility. These are all things that hadn't been considered before. So because we've done so well with uh, past adversaries, we're now expanding to um, add more, even more parameters um, um, on, our, on those. However, that last paper, um, they made a lot of progress, uh, but they still need to retrain uh, when they want to add a new class or they, when they want to uh, update their system with the latest version of the web pages they're fingerprinting. Uh, even though the, the training is uh, considerably lighter than that required before. Uh, another work published again this year that is trying to address the stainless problem um, is taking an alternative um, approach and what they do is they, they use fewer data so that there is less data dependency, uh, but they manage to retain the same performance achieved by past works.
from our perspective, where this whole thing is going is transfer learning. So just a short introduction in transfer learning in that the context of fingerprinting is um, given a machine learning model, transfer le learning enables that model to be trained on one task and then be repurposed uh, at a very low cost for a second related task. Uh, in the fingerprinting context, uh, this means um, transferable models across various dimensions. Uh, the temporal, for example, which is relevant to data staleness, um, across websites and web pages. So you train their model on one website and then you can move it on another one. Um, with uh, regards to, to the location of the victim, so maybe your training data originated from one uh, physical location, but then the victim is somewhere else in the world. Um, does the model transfer well across locations? And then also protocol versions, either this is TOR protocol versions or uh, TLS protocol versions. Overall, the goal of this kind of uh, exploration is to see how versatile, can, versatile versions can become across all those dimensions. Uh, to do that, we actually designed a um, couple of experiments and we collected a completely new data set. We focused on TLS fingerprinting. Um, we collected a data set uh, around 19,000 Wikipedia articles. So our adversary is trying to distinguish which article, uh, which Wikipedia article the victim is visiting. Uh, to collect our um, data set, we visited each article 100 times, um, each time from one uh, different Amazon instance, and we spread our, spread our instances into five dif different physical locations around the globe. On the left here, we have a um, visual representation of our data set. We split our data set into two parts, the green part, uh, that contains the subsets A and B, and the blue part that contains the subsets C and D. Um, the first part, the, the green part, contains uh, 6,000 classes, while uh, the blue part contains 13,000 different classes. Each of those parts um, features 100 samples, traffic traces, in other words, uh, of, of its class, and then uh, the subsets essentially split those samples. So subset A has 90 samples for every class, Subset B has 10 samples for every class, and the same holds for C and D. Now, moving on to our fingerprinting pipeline, um, without going into the technical details, the fingerprinting, our fingerprinting pipeline is using an embedding model, which is trained to map um, vector inputs, essentially, in that case, the, sequen the, bytes of se uh, the sequences of bytes, uh, into, a multi into a point, into a multi-dimensional space. What the adversary does is uh, they gather a set of reference samples and then embed them um, using the trained embedding model. Uh, every time a new input is com comes from the victim, uh, the adversary embeds that input as well and then classifies it based on the proximity to the reference samples. Experiments, our first experiment is uh, actually a ground truth experiment, so it's not a transfer learning one. We trained our model on subset A, which contains 6,000 classes um, and 90 samples for each of those classes. And we tested it on subset B, which contains, again, 10, um, 10 previously seen samples from those 6,000 classes. Um, as we can see on the figure on the right, uh, the blue line is for a, a version of the experiment where we tested with uh, just 500 classes. And we can see that after three guesses, the adversary reaches uh, an accuracy that is higher than 90%. Now, three guesses means that the adversary is allowed to guess three potential classes instead of just one. Uh, if, we move, if we move to uh, the larger version of the experiment, where um, the samples were, that the adversary would see were coming from all 6,000 possible classes, uh, the accuracy, of course, decreases, but still, the adversary, if, if is, the adversary is allowed to guess um, up to 10 classes, then uh, the accuracy reaches uh, quickly uh, up above 80%. Now, moving on to experiment number two, this is a transfer learning experiment. Uh, we kept the same model from experiment number one that was trained on uh, the original 600 classes, subset A, uh, 90 samples per class, and, but it was tested on subset D, which contained samples, 10 samples from 13,000 different classes that were previously unseen for the model. Um, to, for the reference set, we used subset C. So subset C contain, so contains uh, 90 samples from, again, 13,000 classes that the model has never seen before. 
and we classified subset D as said earlier. As we see, as we can see on the figure on the right, the accuracy didn't change that much. So if we go on the 500 classes uh, version of the experiment, again, after three guesses, we have almost 90% accuracy. Moving on to the 6,000 classes uh, version of the experiment, again, with 10 guesses, you reach um, a little bit above 80% accuracy, which is fairly good. And for the 13,000 um, classes version of the experiment, we still have a very good accuracy of um, above 80%, if the adversary is allowed to guess um, 20 potential labels, for example. Um, to put this into perspective, the adversary is allowed to guess 20 labels out of the 13,000 possible. Uh, moving on to the takeaways, machine learning is advancing in a, a very fast pace, and this is triggering advancements and changes in other fields where it is applicable in. Um, in the case of fingerprinting, this allowed us to achieve very high accuracy in the uh, our already existing adversarial models, but also gave us the latitude to envision new, more realistic adversaries. Uh, however, an unfortunate effect is that because uh, these kind of models um, are more easily applicable for attacks, um, there is a disproportionate um, number of papers on fingerprinting attacks and only fewer, fewer papers on countermeasures. So maybe this is something we need to put more effort on. Uh, thank you very much and we're open to questions.